In part three of this series, we will discuss the Romaic Greek language and culture and the names of the Greeks. A century after Constantine, in the fifth century, the Goths, Anglo-Saxons, and Franks conquered the Western territories of the Roman Empire. Greek and Latin speakers in these territories became subject to uncivilized Germanic tribes. Many of these Germans were Aryans, especially in Spain and North Africa. During the sixth century, Emperor Justinian recovered Italy, part of Spain and all of North Africa. In the seventh century, Islam emerges as a new faith. Within 70 years, the Muslim Arabs conquered the Hellenized territories of Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and Libya, also the Latin-speaking Carthage and Spain. It is interesting that the Nestorians and Copts collaborated with the Arabs, opening their city gates to them to rid themselves of Roman Orthodox rule. Something similar happened in Spain and France when the Arabs invaded during the 8th century. The Orthodox Roman subjects of the Visigoths in Spain and the Franks in France collaborated with the Arabs. That explains how Spain was conquered by the Arabs so fast. However, the Arab invasion of France failed despite the alliance with the Western Romans. The Franks took drastic measures against their West Roman subjects. Previously, they had replaced en masse the Western Roman bishops with Frankish noble military officers. After subduing the Western Roman revolutions, Charles Martel dismantled Roman cities and transported their Western Roman subjects to serf camps called villas and mansi. Most cities founded by the Romans in France were abandoned as their inhabitants were reduced to serfs and villains. They remained in the miserable state of serfdom till the French Revolution of 1789. And all this thanks to Charlemagne, the so-called father of Europe. Besides taking over control of the church in France, the Franks, with the excuse of saving the Church of Old Rome from the Lombards, invaded Italy and created the Papal State from the Italian territories of the Roman Empire. Thus, they secured their influence on the Pope of Rome. Many popes tried to resist the strangulation of the Western Orthodox Church by the Franks, especially opposing their filioque heresy. However, the Franks invaded Rome once again in the late 10th century and imposed Germanic nobles as popes, who immediately accepted the filioque heresy and ratified the control of the Western Roman Church by Frankish noble military officers. The schism of the Eastern Roman Church and the Western Frankish Church followed. Old Rome in captivity was separated from New Rome and the other patriarchates of the East. Why is this church history important for our topic? Because Charlemagne and the Franks were not feeling secure enough by capturing the church of their Western Roman subjects. They had to break all their ties with the Eastern Romans in order to prevent the Eastern Romans instigating the revolutions of their Western Roman subjects. First, Charlemagne convened two Frankish church councils where he condemned the Orthodox Eastern Romans as heretics and pagans, whether iconophiles or iconoclasts, since they rejected the filioque Frankish innovation. Then his advisors started claiming that Old Rome was always a Latin-speaking city. They continued with the widespread propaganda that the Eastern Romans should not be called Romans but Greeks for three reasons. Number one, they are heretic pagan Gentiles, a synonym for Greek. Number two, they spoke Greek and not Latin, which they claimed was the only language of the Romans. And number three, they had abandoned old Rome. From 800 AD and later, Western writers never again called the Eastern Empire Roman, but only the Greek Empire. And its inhabitants were never again called Romans, but only Greeks, based more on their Orthodox religion than their Greek language. The Franks kept the name Roman for their Western Roman subjects and Catholic for their Frankish church. In the 11th century, they called their state 
Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, meaning that the Germans are lords and the Western Romans are their subjects. Mission accomplished for the Germans. The Western Roman slaves of the Franks were permanently separated from their free Eastern Roman brothers who had been systemically demonized as Greek and heretic. The Eastern Roman Emperor was insulted by being called a Greek Emperor by King Louis of Francia. However, the Eastern Romans were still very powerful and did not worry greatly about the schism with the barbarian West. The Eastern Roman Empire continued calling itself Romania and its multi-ethnic Orthodox citizens as Romans. The Arabs in Syria also continued calling their Christian subjects Roman. The Eastern Roman Empire continued being the universal center of education, art, science, with a university in Constantinople and a huge library treasuring parchment copies of all the masterpieces of literature, science, and wisdom since ancient times. The Eastern Roman Empire was a monarchy, but not a tyranny. The emperor had to prove himself as the chosen one of God and was accountable to the Senate, the Patriarch of the Army, and the people of Constantinople. If he failed his task, he could easily be replaced by whoever convinced the people that he could do a better job. The position of emperor was accessible to anyone Orthodox, regardless of language, race, color, or class. There were emperors that were Greek, Latin, Armenian, Turkish, Arab, etc. To this day, in very democratic England and Holland and Spain, you may not become king unless you are of royal Frankish or Norman blood. The Eastern Romans followed peaceful anti-war policies with their neighbors. Peace negotiations were always preferable to war. In the 9th century, the Roman state became actively involved in missionary work in Eastern Europe amongst the Slavs. A new alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, was created based on the Greek alphabet. The Bible and church texts were translated to Slavonic. Roman Orthodox missionaries never demanded that new converts use Greek language or even the Greek alphabet. On the contrary, the Frankish missionaries required universal use of the Latin mass by all peoples and nations. However, new enemies emerged during the 11th century. The Normans occupied all the Roman territories in southern Italy, and the Seljuk Turks invaded Anatolia. The decisive blow came unexpectedly from an ally, the Venetians, who assisted the Franks of the, first, of the Fourth Crusade in 1204 in their conquest of Constantinople. The people of Constantinople were massacred, the churches were desecrated, treasures protected for more than a millennium were looted or carried away in the West. The empire was fragmented in a multitude of small Frankish, Venetian, and Roman states. Constantinople was recovered by the Romans 50 years later, but never managed to become a powerful and stable empire again. In 1453, the Ottoman Turks gave the final blow. They conquered Constantinople and all the surrounding Roman, Frankish, and Venetian states. The Ottoman Empire succeeded in expanding and including all the old territories of the prior Eastern Roman Empire. The Turks re recognized all their Orthodox subjects as Romans, regardless of language. They called their European territories Rumelia, land of the Romans. Despite Islam professing tolerance towards Christians, the Roman Christians suffered from forced conversions of their children recruited as Janissaries in the Ottoman army. In certain areas, Greek education or even speaking the Greek language was prohibited. The Germanic and Latin church propaganda against the Roman Orthodox continued even as they had been enslaved by the Turks. It actually became more successful because the enslaved Eastern Romans had no political existence in order to react. During the Renaissance in the 16th century, the Germans were exposed to Greek literature, which they started to appreciate. They managed to realize that there was more to Greeks and Hellenes than paganism. They were the source of ancient wisdom and the forefathers of all sciences. They realized that the name Greek was not as derogatory and offensive for the Eastern Romans as their forefather Charlemagne had meant it to be. Therefore, 
they coined a new name for the Eastern Romans. From now on, they would not call them the Greek Empire, but rather the Byzantine Empire. That would allow Western scholars to distinguish the good ancient Greeks from the hated Christian Greeks of the Middle Ages. Since the 16th century and long after the fall of Constantinople, Western historians have referred to the Eastern Roman Empire as the Byzantine Empire. The worst part is that the ignorant modern Greek historians accepted and allowed this neologism in Greek history books. This has been creating major confusion to the modern Greeks who may recognize Hellenes, Greeks, and Romans as their ancestors, but feel no connection to the term Byzantines, which is supposed to describe their immediate ancestors. There were numerous revolutions against the Turks that failed. The revolution of 1821 started from Wallachia or modern Romania. The Wallachians or Vlachs are the remaining Latin speakers of the Eastern Roman Empire. They still live in many areas of Northern Greece and consider themselves one nation with the Greek speakers of modern Greece. The revolution in Wallachia failed but succeeded in the rugged terrain of Southern Greece. The Romans of Southern Greece succeeded in creating a free state. Its capital initially was Nafplio or Napoli of Romania to be distinguished from Napoli of it Italia, which is Naples. The liberated Romans included not only Greek speakers, but also Albanian speakers and Vlach Latin speakers. They all felt as one nation, however. Their ultimate goal was to liberate their capital Constantinople and reestablish the Roman Empire. However, they soon discovered that such a plan was very much against the agenda of France and England, the spiritual descendants of Charlemagne. The Western powers would allow the descendants of the ancient Greeks to be free again, but never allow the rising back of the Eastern Roman or Greek or Byzantine Empire. The Romans realized that without the support of Western Europe, their new state would not survive against the Turks. They had to compromise. A political decision was made to reject their Roman identity and any attachments to the Byzantine Empire. They would assume the name Hellenes and Hellas for their kingdom. They would accept to be called Greeks by the West, meaning descendants of the ancient Greeks who had revolted against the Turks, but also against the hated Byzantines. To ensure success of this propaganda amongst the newly liberated Romans, the politicians agreed to accept a Catholic German king named Otto to govern Greece. Otto and his German ministers re-educated the people about their identity as Greeks and not Romans. They broke ties with the Patriarchate of Constantinople because it stood for the Eastern Roman identity and they established the Schismatic Church of Greece. They forcibly persecuted the Orthodox monks and the nuns, forced them to marry and shut down hundreds of monasteries in the kingdom of Hellas or Greece. They knew that the monasteries had preserved the Orthodox and Roman identity of the Roman slaves during the 400 years of Turkish yoke. The Greek national poet Kostis Palamas said, we are Hellenes only to please the Western powers, but in truth, we are simply Romans. The result has been that after 200 years of brainwash, we have Greek people who come and ask, why do you say that we are Roman? Did the Romans not conquer us? Charlemagne could not have imagined such success of his work 1,200 years earlier. Most descendants of the Romans nowadays have been convinced that they are not Romans. The Greeks used the following names for themselves throughout different periods in history. During the Bronze Age, Achaeans or Danaans. During the Archaic, Classic and Hellenistic eras, they called themselves Hellenes. During the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, and through the Ottoman occupation, they called themselves Romeos, or Roman. After the formation of the Kingdom of Hellas, or Greece, in 1832, they started gradually reusing the name Hellene. Today, most Greeks self-identify as Hellenes. They also use the name Romeos, or Roman, but they never use the name Greek or Yunnan, which are clearly exonyms. The West has used the term Greek since ancient times. 
In medieval times, the Western Romans recognized the Greeks as Romans and called them Eastern Romans. In later medieval times, after 800 AD, the West was conquered by Germanic tribes who developed an antagonistic hatred towards the Eastern Romans and therefore started calling them Greeks with undisguised contempt. The term Byzantines was invented in the 17th century and was also used with contempt. When Greece was liberated after 1830, the West reintroduced the term Greeks again and considered them as descendants of the ancient Greeks who became free not only from Ottomans, but also from the Romans and Byzantines. The Oriental countries called the ancient Greeks Yunnan, Ionians. They called medieval Greek speakers Romans. For modern Greeks, they use the term Yunnan when they refer to the modern state of Greece, but the term Roman for the Greek Orthodox inhabitants of Turkey and the Middle East. The names used for the Greeks can also be categorized according to the time period of their origin. Names describing Greeks of Paleolithic origin are likely the names Seli, Greki, and Dorians. Names describing Greeks of Neolithic origin include Pelasgian, Achaean, Ionian, and Hellene. In historical times, when Greeks were mixed with Latin and other speakers with whom they shared a common culture, they were called Romans. We analyzed some of these names, such as Achaean, Ionian, and Dorian during the first part of the series. Let's discuss the rest of the names now, and especially the names Danan, Hellene, Greek, and Roman. The Danans is a synonym of Achaeans and refers to Mycenaean Greeks as described by Homer in his epic poems. Danaos fled from Egypt to the Peloponnese in Greece, where he became king and started a line of Mycenaean rulers. In prehistoric times, the name Hellene derived from the ancient Seli, priests of Zeus and Epirus. The Seli meant the wise men. The word Seli originated from Selas, which means light. Another theory claimed that the name derived from Hellene, a Mycenaean era king of Ptia, Thessaly in central Greece. In the Iliad of Homer, the only Greeks called Hellenes were the soldiers of Achilles from Ptia, Thessaly. The general term was Achaeans or Danans. In classic times, the name Hellene spread throughout and became the general and common name describing all Greek tribes. Still later, the name Hellene took a religious connotation when the Hellenic culture was met by the Jews of Palestine. To the Jews, Hellene became synonymous to pagan. The Christians of the Roman Empire inherited this terminology from the Jews. In the Roman world, a Hellene was worshiper of the Olympian gods and a promoter of paganism in general. However, by the sixth century, once paganism faded away, the name Hellene disappeared as well. The Christian Greek speakers only called themselves Romans. The name Hellene resurfaced during the 19th century as political reasons made the Kingdom of Greece emphasize its historical connection to classical Athens and loosen its ties to Constantinople, New Rome, and ignore the Eastern Roman ancestry of its inhabitants. Hellene is indeed a name that connects Greeks to their ancient glorious past of classic Athens, Sparta, and Alexander. The name Hellene makes no historical hints about the history of this people during medieval times. That creates confusion in the mind of many modern Greeks as to the identity of their ancestors during medieval times when no people claimed the name Hellene. Greki or Greeks means the old men. According to Aristotle, the Illyrians were the first to use this term to describe their neighboring Dorian Greeks in Epirus. The Latin speakers in Italy use the term to describe all Greek speakers. Magna Grecia, or Big Greece, was the name of southern Italy due to the density of Greek colonies there. Later, during early Christian times, the term Greek, similarly to the term Hellene, became a synonym for pagan, till paganism disappeared in the Roman Empire and everyone became a Christian and a Roman. 
The term Greek was reinvented by Charlemagne and his advisors in the 9th century to rename the Eastern Romans and reinforce the propaganda of demonization of the Eastern Romans in the eyes of the Western Roman serfs. The Western Europe of the Middle Ages ignored the scientific and artistic achievements of the ancient Greeks and considered the term Greek insulting enough for enemies and equivalent to the terms pagan and heretic. When the Renaissance discovered those achievements, the term Greek was not insulting enough, and therefore the Eastern Romans were not called Greeks anymore, but Byzantines. The inhabitants of modern Greece are also called Greeks by the West, and most Westerners consider them descendants of ancient Greece with no clear association to Eastern Romans or Byzantines. In ancient times, the Romans were the bilingual citizens of the Greek city of Rome. After the third century, Romans were all the citizens of the Roman Empire, from England to Egypt and from Morocco to the Crimea. In the fourth century, the residents of Constantinople or New Rome became as much Romans as the residents of Old Rome. In the Eastern Roman Empire and Ottoman Empires, all Orthodox Christians were considered Romans. In the 18th century Ottoman Empire, the revolutionary Rigas Fereos claimed that the empire included four nations based on religion and not language. These were the Romans, the Turks, the Armenians, and the Jews. The Romans were the Orthodox Christians, whether they spoke Greek, Albanian, Slavic, Turkish, or Arabic. In modern times, people who still self-identify as Romans are generally all Orthodox nations that were once part of the Eastern Roman Empire, such as Greeks of modern Greece, including Arvanites, Vlachs, and Slavic speakers, Romani, Romanians and all Vlachs, Orthodox Albanians, the Rum Orthodox Arabic speakers of Turkey, Syria, Jordan, and Israel. Despite the brainwash of 200 years, the Roman identity has not been forgotten in Greece because it is mentioned in traditional songs and poems and stories. The poet Costis Palamas liked to quote the dying words of a Greek hero before his throat was slit by Ali Pasha. Romios ego genithika, Romios tenapethano. I was born a Roman, I shall die a Roman. The dream of every modern Greek or Hellene is to liberate Constantinople. It is deeply ingrained in the modern inhabitants of Greece and Greek speakers throughout the world, even as they have embraced the name Hellene and make minimal use of the name Roman, that their cultural center is Constantinople and not Athens. This is called the grand idea expressed by the old popular verse. After years and times, those lands, meaning Constantinople and Anatolia, will belong to us again. The name Romeos, or Roman, identifies with the dome of Saint Sophia, Romaic modern Greek, and homesickness for the Eastern Roman Empire. It is a historically more inclusive term for all who embrace the Hellenic culture in its Christianized form. The Roman name incarnates the Hellenic vision of Alexander, the proclamation of equality of Saint Paul, and the legacy of Constantine. The name Roman stands for the result of the historical meeting of Hellenism and Christian revelation. The Hellenic quest for the truth found its fulfillment in the revealed truth of Christ. The Christian Roman Empire was in this sense a Hellenistic state that promoted not only art, literature, and science, but especially the truth of Christ it had been seeking and finally discovered. Greek, Hellene, and Roman are synonyms for the same culture. The Roman name is a more inclusive term that embraces all who accept the Hellenic ideals of freedom, quest for the truth and virtue, the common Christianized Hellenic culture. All who accept this culture regardless of preferred language. Why is all this important? Why are names important? Charlemagne knew that the best way to destroy a nation is by wiping its historic memory first. In an era of globalization and diversity, our Roman past has had a tremendous historic experience in integrating cultures, embracing different peoples and languages, and assimilating them by spreading civilization. It happened in Anatolia, Italy, Egypt, the Middle East. It happened with the Serbs, the Bulgarians, the Moravians, and the Russians. The preference of the name Greek 
to please the Western powers was a compromise that backfired because the Greeks, by focusing on their Hellenic nationalism, almost lost their connection in the family of other Romans around the Mediterranean. The other Roman family members, such as Vlachs, Arvanites, Arabic Orthodox, have traditionally looked up to the Greek speakers for guidance. Since the Bible and the ecumenical synods and the writings of the fathers and the hymnography have been carried on the shoulders of the Greek language, by becoming isolated, however, in our Hellenic nationalism, the Greeks lost that connection. If Roman style, universalism, or globalization based on the truth of orthodoxy does not take initiative and set the example for unity of peoples, then the path to globalization will unavoidably move on different paths potentially dragging humanity into uncharted waters. The Greek language through its history has been tried successfully and has an established track record. It served to promote freedom, democracy, literature, art, science, and the truth of the one holy apostolic and Catholic Church. It has shown fruits, and not just leaves, by nurturing apostolic fathers, ascetics, hierarchs, and martyrs. The Greek language is like an umbilical cord. It connects to the truth of orthodoxy. Other languages need to also develop such a track record before they can safely cut themselves away from the umbilical cord. Till then, the Greek language will always be there to serve humanity and lead it to the truth as it has always done in its history.